Hello, this is Humanitarian Engineering. Um, we're going to talk about several issues in humanitarian um, technology today. The first issue is technologies for people who are homeless. So really what these are is examples of appropriate technology. These are ones that are directed at people who are homeless in uh, Columbus, Ohio, actually. So it's sort of a representative case for people who are homeless in the United States. Um, you might recall some information about homelessness in the United States uh, um, last year. There are 643,000 estimated people who are homeless in the United States. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of people that are living outside, and this causes for them some significant um, survival challenges. Um, and so our appropriate technologies will be um, sort of designed to help people survive outside. Um, you will see a number of relationships to issues associated also with the developing world. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is present for you some design challenges um, we have. Some of these um, came from uh, Kent Bytel, who's the uh, director of the Open Shelter in Columbus, Ohio, um, who we've been working with for some time now. Um, so the first one is a makeshift shelter, that is a personal shelter. Um, and there's 11 um, design constraints here <coughs> we've been told about. This does not mean that each person would have these all of these constraints. They may have some of these constraints, and they may have some constraints that aren't listed here. These are just meant to be representative. So the first one is, is the use of free or low-cost local materials um, that can be obtained easily. Um, what you certainly want weather, weather resistance to cold, snow, ice, and rain. Um, it gets quite cold in Columbus, Ohio. It's not unusual for it to hit zero degrees Fahrenheit, for instance, or colder. Um, snow in this area is it ha it's going on every winter. Um, also, usually ice. There's rain, of course, at various times through the rest of the year. Um, so, so whatever shelter there is, it has to protect against um, these things to the greatest extent possible. And then there's the issue of a wet, muddy, and cold ground. Um, if people are sleeping possibly on the ground, you like to get them up off the ground. They might elevate the shelter a little bit. Some people have suggested using a pallet, and other people use various um, makeshift uh, mattresses, for instance, made out of plastic bags woven together, um, or some people would use a tarp. Um, you want um, a sturdy shelter so it won't collapse under snow and ice loads, um, which can be significant. It wouldn't be unusual to have um, a foot of snow, for instance. Um, You'd like to have ventilation that's convenient. This is going to be a difficult issue um, because if you add ventilation, of course, then the cold can come in. Um, but you have to have ventilation just to be able to breathe. And also, if there's uh, any type of uh, combustion in the tent via candle or elsewhere, other. Um, and then you want to be able to convert it easily from summer to winter living if you're living outside over a full year or longer. Um, you want it, of course, to be rugged or durable um, to get a long life out of it. Um, you want good internal light, which conflicts with the desire, perhaps, to have shelter over top of you. You might want it transportable, and, and um, you might carry it or use the cart that we're going to discuss in a minute. But the transportability issue can be really important because um, if it's a good shelter, it may get stolen if you're... Um, out somewhere during the day, um, for instance, at a job or if you're at a, um, getting food somewhere. Um, you want it to be able to secure it so you can't steal the shelter itself easily or what's in it. Um, next, uh, you want it to be aesthetically pleasing or camouflaged so that people will not be as likely to be removed from various locations by authority in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it's, it's not that uncommon for um, the, a group of um, shelters to be bulldozed by the authorities because uh, it's uh, illegal to stay in a certain location. Um, so the list is rather long, but um, 
I think there's a number of um, good possibilities or options um, for being able to create the shelter. Of course, what you really want to do is start out with participatory action research, that is, ask people what they want or need and, um, and go from there. Um, you may have to design a, a multiple types of shelters um, to satisfy um, needs. All right, let's consider another example, that is heating for a tent or shelter. Um, you want it to be safe and non or low polluting so it can be used inside a tent or shelter that's closed in the winter. So this is a pretty um, difficult issue. Um, usually you want it to provide sufficient heat output during the winter to keep um, the, the shelter warm the whole night. Um, you want, of course, low cost fuel. And um, you don't want it to have to be tended that much so that people can sleep well. Um, these are some pretty severe constraints. Um, sometimes now people use candles to heat a tent. Um, other times they use propane heaters to heat a tent, but these ideas are also used for other shelters. Um, so another one is lighting for a tent or shelter. This is similar to the developing world case for lighting. You want something safe and non-polluting so it can be used inside the shelter. Um, so, uh, such as using a solar lantern with a battery, a panel, and a bright LED as an option. Um, you want it to provide sufficient light for reading or work. Uh, of course, you want low-cost fuel. Um, and you want it to last long enough for a given charge. And you got to take into consideration how sunny it is outside. I mean, in Columbus, Ohio, it's often um, cloudy, um, in particular in the winter. Um, and you wonder if you're going to get a, a good enough charge to be able to light for long enough um, in, in after it goes, gets dark. Um, so another thing is neat is cook, cooking methods. These are um, methods that are safe and non or low cost polluting so they can be used inside a tent or shelter and provide sufficient heat for completely cooking meals and it uses a low cost fuel. Also important is sanitation methods to capture human waste or and dispose of it and, and methods to dispose of trash. Um, it's, this is actually um, important because if, if people trash up their um, shelter area, they're often thrown out. So um, ways to deal with the issue of trash need to be developed. Um, also, um, there's a uh, need for a cart for materials and belongings. Um, sometimes shopping carts are used for this, but larger wheels are probably needed, so it's easier to move the cart over rough terrain, such as in the woods. Um, a cart can be secured against um, theft, um, and uh, you want it to be weather resistant. Um, and then there's a question of whether you should pull it behind you or push it forward. So the open, at the open shelter, they have this approach. What they do is, in working with downtown businesses in Columbus, Ohio, um, the businesses donated um, pull-behind luggage uh, for people to put their stuff in and, uh, because it's not an eyesore, um, and uh, people are really liking the solution, actually. Um, next, the progress for some of this is, is at the, uh, the Community Technology Clinic um, website. Um, you can um, Google that and take a look. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, different technologies that have already been developed. Um, and uh, so what there is, there's three pieces to this clinic. Um, I've just described one. So we call it technologies for people on the ground, you know, people who are homeless, for instance. Uh, we, the other thing that we can do is, is do a computer education for people. But uh, um, the third thing there is, is technology to help the helpers. In other words, we work, we've work we worked with um, social services and compu and food, pan uh, food pantry to help them out with technological issues so that they can better serve um, their clients. Um, for you OSU people, I would call for, have put out a call for volunteers that would possibly have um, course credit. Um, that would help satisfy the uh, six credit or um, project component of the humanitarian engineering minor um, to work with the clinic on these problems. 
Again, I emphasize that you, uh, you can go look at the website, which you can get to by clicking the gray um, community technology clinic um, link on the upper left hand corner or just Google it. Okay. Um, next, let's switch topics. So let's go to um, what I'm calling humanitarian technology evaluation and comparison. This could be for communities uh, considering off the shelf technology. So you do uh, a needs, assets, uh, desires assessment, and people say they, they want some, some, they want to get some problem solved, and you help, and you say, well, I know there's a certain number of off-the-shelf technologies we need to consider, we need to evaluate which one's the best. That's what this lecture, this piece of the lecture is about. The other possibility is, is that you work with an NGO that is seeking to purchase the best humanitarian technology, and the problem is really similar. It's just that you might be talking uh, a lot with an NGO also, in addition to the community. Um, so the steps to this process is to get the problem statement, first of all. So use the above approaches, that is like, you know, participatory action research for needs and assets assessment, you, uh, for instance. And um, then the methodology is you do research. In other words, you figure out what technologies are available. You get a candidate set of technologies that are off the shelf. So these this, this set, um, you know, it depends on the, the quality of the possibilities, but it may be three technology, two or more technologies, maybe 10. Next, you um, evaluate those, and then you make a recommendation. So what we're going to do is assume that the process of the, the candidate set of technologies is that process has been done. The research has been done. You get the set. How do we evaluate and recommend? That is steps three and four. That's what we're going to study. It's how to do that in a quantitative way. So we're going to look at two um, methods. The the first one is assess and rank method. A second one is compare to baseline and rank. Um, usually the second one can be, people often like it because if there's an existing technology that's being used by a community or NGO, um, then it becomes the baseline and you do all evaluations relative to the baseline. Okay, but we'll talk about you know the each of these methods and then the relationships between these two methods. Next, so the assess and rank approach, so we're going to have features, we're going to call them, of the technology. So you're holding a piece of technology and it has, um, you have N such pieces of technology. If you pick up one, each one has M features that are going to be indexed with J. So a feature is, is meant to be very general. It's going to include cost, actually. It's going to include the various characteristics of a technology that might be of interest for you. So for instance, for a cook stove, it might include um, fuel efficiency, size of cooking area, um, cost, etc. Now, we're going to do an assessment of the features that we're going to call that numeric value FIJ. So the feature assessment for the ith technology for the J feature, and it's going to lie between 0 and 1. Okay, and um, you can think of it as a rating, essentially, between the two. Um, it, it, or you could think about it as being 0 to 100% performance and then just divide by 100. Um, the problem is that we're going to have to confront, though, is, is that it can be difficult to find some evaluation for some feature, or it simply may be unknown. You may, you, the manufacturer may not provide the appropriate information or data um, what may happen in these situations is you may know a range of the FIJ values and you may be able to later consider that range. We'll do that when we discuss sensitivity analysis. Another um, approach that's sometimes uh, convenient is use what's called a gross assessment. So you would let FIJ not be between 0 and 1 but e either 0 or 1. So this might indicate if it's one, it would indicate the presence of a feature, and if it's zero, it would represent the absence of a feature. And that's all you would do in the terms of assessment. Sometimes that's a, a good idea, too, if you don't know exactly how to numerically assess a feature, just to say zero or one. Next, we're going to use weights. Um, we're going to rate the importance of a feature, wj, j equal one to m, and this importance factor 
um, would normally be specified by a client community or the NGO, not you, um, because they're the ones that say what's important about the technology, the various aspects of the technology or the features of the technology. Here you could also use relative weights, which would mean that you would use, um, uh, for instance, uh, let's say it's WJR or relative weights, they would be equal to W j divided by the sum of the wj's um, and uh, in that way they would lie between 0 and 1. Here just to, in the book that case is covered in in great detail but here I'm just going to focus on the simpler case and that is when the weights are wj and they just simply lie between 0 and 1. So after we have the assessments and the constraints we got to aggregate them into a quality assessment for technology I and that's the formula you, you see there in the middle of the slide it's PI is a sum from J equal 1 to M WJ FIJ right? and that clearly will lie between 0 and M because there's M possible um, features. Now this is a simple linear combination of the importance factors or weightings and the um, assessments, the numerical assessments. But there's many other possibilities here. You, you could use a sum of the squares of the assessments or a minimax approach. And I'll just refer you to the book on that. Next, the highest quality technology is the one um, that achieves um, the highest PI value. Okay, so you just take your PI values, I equal 1 to N, and you order them from the highest value to the lowest value, and then argmax just picks off the index with the p that has the highest value and I will call that I star. Now that's the one you would normally consider recommend, recommending um, to the community or um, client or NGO. Um, it's interesting though you can use this formulation to compare to other technologies so if you want to compare to the best if I take an arbitrary technology I, I not equal to I star, and I form that difference, PI star minus PI, well, that tells you how far below the quality of the best technology is the ith one. All right? You could also compare to, the, to a baseline. Um, if you have IB representing a baseline technology, you could take um, PIB minus PI, and if it's greater than zero, then that means that it that the baseline's better than the ith technology. On the other hand, if PIB um, is less than PI, that meaning that PI is greater than PIB, then PI is better than the baseline. So you have something to recommend that's better than the baseline, which may be the technology that they're using. Okay, so you can um, compare technologies. Now let's look at a second method. So as opposed to the assess and rank method, let's look at compare to baseline and rank. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do feature assessment relative to the baseline. So I'm going to call those F, I, J, B. They're between minus 1 and plus 1, and it's evaluation of feature J for technology I. Um, according to that formula, it's a simple difference. So the quality relative to the baseline is simply similar to the earlier formula. Um, so we have PIB defined there. This is a different numeric value, obviously, um, compared to the PI values we've discussed up till now, um, or up till the earlier. So the best is still going to be computed as I star as an element of, of the argmax, which just says pick the best technology, okay, according to the quality rankings. Um, so what's interesting here, though, is, is literally that I star is the same as the I star that we talked about earlier. I'll talk about that on the next slide. These can also be gross assessments, obviously, obviously um, of uh, the FIJs between minus, or being values of simply minus one, zero, or plus one, indicating that a feature is below the same or above the baseline. And then you could do a sum of the features that are above or below the baseline and use that as your ranking, to, to rank the, the technologies. But it's interesting if you compare the two approaches. That is, compare the assess and rank to the compare to baseline and rank. 
So recall the top two formulas that were just on the previous slides. And then go to the middle formula. So what I do is I say PIB is equal to that sum. And rather than writing um, um, down FIJB, I write down um, its substitution from the top equation on the slide. And when you do that, then I just take the sum over the, two, the subtraction, and I get the sum in the, the first one, at the first bracket, and then the, the next is minus the second bracket. Well, what's interesting here, first of all, is that the first bracket term is PI. I mean, that's what we've studied all before, earlier. The second term, if you look at it for a minute, there's no I's there. So, in other words, that term is not dependent on I, which implies it's a constant independent of I. It's the same constant for all I. So, what that means is that the quality assessment that is, PI and PIB are just shifted values by the same constant of each other. Therefore, the best is same for both approaches. In other words, you get the same recommendation. And that's what the formula says at the bottom. We get the same recommendation. Okay. Um, so there's no reason then to do both approaches. You just pick one or the other. Next, let's talk about computations and how you would actually... Um, um, go about um, these evaluations. You could use a computer program, of course, or a spreadsheet. I'm going to primarily talk about the spreadsheet case. Um, so the rows of the spreadsheet would correspond to technology options. The columns would co correspond to features. The body of the table um, would be the matrix, FIJ, and then that specified the FI, specified by the FIJ elements. The top row um, could be the WJ weights, and then the formulas will compute the technology qualities, rank, and maybe highlight the best. For instance, you could color in the best technology. Okay. Now, this can be an extremely useful um, program to use because then you can change the values of FIJ and WJ, and you can watch the rank ordering po possibly change. It can give great insight into um, the evaluation process. Okay. Um, next, with respect to analytical or mathematical sensitivity analysis, if you perturb one parameter, JP or WP, it's simple to see that the partials are given as shown. So what these partials mean, the one on the left means that the biggest PI change from perturbing a feature, okay, that is FIJP, where JP is the one uh, I'm going to perturb, um, uh, I'm, is is the one with the greatest importance, okay? So that can tell you um, that the um, something about how to design a technology too, because if you increase the features assessment um, and you know that the one associated with WJP, that's the highest one, will increase the quality the most. Now, if in your current set of technologies that's not possible to just arbitrarily increase FIJP, well, then you may say, well, I need to design a new technology. Okay. Next, uh, I'm going to perturb WJP. There's a typo up in the upper right. It should be WJP, not WP. Um, so partial PI with respect to WJP, if you do the math, it's very easy with the derivatives to see that it's FIJP. Well, that says something similar to what we have before. So if you want the biggest PI change from perturbing a weight, that's the feature with the highest assessment. And so you might then reconsider um, how to your, your importance um, measures um, in that this math tells you where to perturb on the matrix of the FIJ values and the, w, the top row, the W. JP values in order to get the best improvements for some technology PI. So you might, for instance, um, take your um, initial results. PI star is your best technology, quality rating for your best technology. You can look at the second best technology and start perturbing the parameters associated with it and seeing if it jumps up to be the best technology. Next, um, if you consider finite rather than infinite perturbations. Um, 
what you really are doing is you're going to, if you make a finite change in any of the parameters, you'll make a finite change in the PI. So the top equation expresses that. You have the new and the old values, and then you have the change in the FIJPs um, defined there. Let's assume they're not equal to zero. Um, and then you let there only be one perturbation at a time. In other words, JP is the only parameter that's perturbed. So if you do that, um, you'll find that the delta PI over delta FIJ, um, which is an approximation of the sensitivity, that sensitivity, is equal to the, the, the equation on the right, which is simply WJP. So it turns out it's exactly the same as with the infinitesimal analysis. And that's simply because this is the, the relationship is uh, linear. Um, that is, the PI is a linear function of the, of the weights and uh, assessment. Um, and the bottom equation tells you how much the quality will change for a given change in a perturbation um, to an assessment on the JP figure. You can do the same thing for um, delta PI, um, divide delta WJP, of course, and you'll find um, analogous um, results. Okay. Enough of the assessment. There's a, a lot, quite a bit more detail in the book. I'm going to move on to humanitarian systems engineering. Um, in particular, I'm going to first talk about wide area problems. So we're getting away from appropriate technology, generally speaking. Um, we might be talking about cases for natural or human-made disasters, coordination of services, for instance, for disasters, digital mapping, agriculture, like large... Um, IT systems for agriculture or radar systems, satellite systems for agriculture, the environment also, monitoring, pollution remediation. There's also the issue of fighting structural injustices. These are the so-called rules of the game, as sometimes people call them. Um, these are typically unfair economic or political systems. So in this situation, I, you can think of it as having a client group. Well, it might be a lot larger than a community. A helper group it might be a whole team of people, including some engineers, and then you have an unjust group, and basically what you're trying to do is, is create technologies to assist the helper group and its fight against the unjust group to help the client group. So let's talk about some examples so I can be more concrete because that's rather abstract. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is open systems. So um, providing information um, for markets is actually very important. In fact, more generally speaking, many people say that economically disadvantaged peoples do not have good information, and that's one of the reasons they do not have a lot of money. So op making information open is generally going to help people that are earning less money. Opening government, government, uh, government budgets up can um, help reduce uh, corruption, promote transparency, um, then there can also be some important software systems, for instance, for bidirectional government populist communication and data, and data analytics so that governments can understand the people and people can understand the governments. Another example, a fourth example, is to use engineering and technology for fighting corruption. Um, uh, my friend Jorge Finke, who's a professor at, um, at Havariana University in Cali, Colombia has been working on this for some time. He's pictured in lower um, right. You can Google him and find out what he's up to. Um, next, I want to talk about um, uh, child trafficking. Um, this is this, this slide's based on conversations with uh, Joe Chong Siri Watana um, from Thailand. Um, He's an OSU graduate from College of Engineering, master, a bachelor's and master's, and he's he, he decided to go back and try to help with this issue there, which is a very um, difficult issue, sad issue, and represents some pure evil, I would say. Um, so he feels that there's engineering and technology that could be done that would help um, alleviate this problem, um, or at least reduce it somewhat. Um, he feels they need a database and tracking software. They, he needs to do data analytics for large-scale problems and try to um, track and capture criminals and rescue children, um, women and men also. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this, um, Joe gave a talk of, for the Humanitarian Engineering Center um, not that long, in 2013, and uh, he's has a call-out for engineering help to help 
help fight child trafficking in uh, in, in Thailand. So if you're interested, um, please contact Joe. Um, okay, thank you.